All right, so today or this month we're going to do as part of our Beckmanic uh, review of anaphylaxis in the pre-hospital setting, uh, particularly a review of what anaphylaxis is and the role of epinephrine. Uh, some of you may remember that we talked about this a, a couple of years ago and are wondering why are we talking about this again. Well, it's... Uh, been something that I've observed that uh, we're seeing a reasonable number of patients with allergic reactions and epinephrine, which is now the drug of choice for allergic reactions, is not being used consistently by our providers. So I felt, uh, you know, uh, summer's coming, exposure to insects and bee stings is uh, around the corner. There's an opportunity for our patients to have an acute allergic reaction. Uh, perhaps it's time to review this topic again. So uh, here we are. So um, the uh, MEC Minute that's been distributed this uh, talk and video um, is focused or based upon a large part uh, the attached article, uh, which is uh, through the National Association of EMS Physicians, uh, and it was put out in 2011 regarding the use of epinephrine for out-of-hospital treatment of anaphylaxis. Um, and uh, it is a position statement uh, by the National Association of EM Physician, EMS Physicians. So it's something that we need to be aware of and we need to follow. So uh, when we talk about allergic reactions uh, and anaphylaxis, what, what is anaphylaxis? Um, and really, uh, it's difficult uh, to determine um, how often it occurs, but it's estimated that uh, about 1.6% of the patients or the population of the United States will suffer some type of anaphylactic event during their lifetime. And, um, and uh, the frequency of uh, hospital admissions for anaphylaxis is going up and has uh, more than doubled uh, between 2000 and 2009. Now that may in part be because of uh, increased focus on allergic reactions and patients reporting uh, adverse events uh, resulting in a hospital presentation. Uh, it may be because of better record keeping, uh, but for whatever reason we're seeing an increased trend in the number of admissions for anaphylaxis, which means people are having more severe uh, events. Um, mortality rate all in all seems to be pr uh, very low, but it's still unfortunate when it occurs. It appears that uh, the mortality rate is uh, uh, less than one patient per one million population uh, will suffer anaphylaxis with death, uh, but if you're that patient or that family member, that's one death too many. Um, while there's really no uh, national data that we can find, uh, the data from Quebec found that about uh, 0.31% uh, or about one out of three, every 300 uh, EMS calls is for anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions. And uh, patients do not always seek medical care and often do not call 911 when having symptoms associated with anaphylaxis or allergic reactions. So a patient who eats something and develops uh, some mild hives uh, may take a Benadryl, or they may develop mild hives, a uh, little wheezing and uh, upset stomach, and they may use their bronchodilators if they have a history of asthma, but they don't uh, seek medical care. So what is anaphylaxis? Uh, anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction, uh, and we'll discuss the criteria in a couple slides. Uh, and what happens is uh, the allergen, the chemical, the protein, whatever's setting off this reaction, binds to a type of immune globulin called IgE. Uh, IgE is uh, something that's present uh, and evaluated for when you're talking about allergies. So if you have a blood test for allergies, um, typically it's a test for IgE. Uh, IgE will bind with certain cells in our blood and our body called mast cells. Uh, these mast cells, when stimulated by IgE, will release, release histamine and other inflammatory substances. And these uh, chemicals cause uh, swelling uh, and the capillary leakage, so the small blood vessels will leak fluid. Uh, will also cause itching, uh, vasodilatation of the blood vessels. Um, will cause uh, small... Um, or smooth muscle constriction and resulting in bronchospasm uh, and pain. So patients can have body pain, abdominal pain, or, or other types of pain associated with the allergic reaction. If you look at the criteria that have been set out by the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but uh, anaphylaxis is likely when, when any uh, one of the three uh, sets of criteria are met. Uh, I'm not going to read them all to you because um, on the next slide uh, it's represented graphically. So um, you can have an acute allergic reaction uh, in when one of the th one of the three columns uh, is appropriate. Uh, the easiest one is column three, uh, which is where the patient is exposed to a known allergen and uh, they develop acute hypotension as a consequence of that exposure. That is uh, that is a um, 
acute anaphylactic reaction, and that's what we think about when we talk about patients have an allergen exposure and then their blood pressure crashes on them. Uh, but the other two possibilities are in the uh, first column uh, where the patient has uh, some type of uh, skin symptoms uh, or mucosal symptoms uh, after exposure to a potential allergen which uh, results in itching or flushing of the skin or hives or angioedema. Angioedema is swelling of the tongue, uh, eyelids, uh, lips and other mucous membranes. So uh, for column one it's that uh, skin symptom and either a respiratory symptom or uh, a change in blood pressure uh, or change in end organ dysfunction. So the patient could develop uh, wheezing, uh, shortness of breath, uh, stridor or hypoxia, um, or they could develop hypotension or evidence of uh, collapse, syncope, and urinary incontinence. Uh, so again, that's the first column. Uh, the second column is skin symptoms again, uh, and, uh, and uh, any, I'm sorry, Column two is they have two or more of the different uh, constellation of symptoms occur. So they have um, uh, could have skin symptoms or respiratory symptoms or end organ symptoms like collapse and syncope, or they could have persistent GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and so on. So uh, in this c uh, column, it's pick two out of the four. And if they have two of the four, then they're probably having an acute uh, allergic or anaphylactic reaction. So this, I think, is a better gr uh, graphic representation than what I had in the uh, previous slide. Anaphylaxis uh, can present in patients without skin uh, symptoms in 10 to 20 percent of patients. So you could have a patient with allergen exposure, developing uh, GI symptoms, uh, shortness of breath. They could have uh, circulatory collapse and hypotension without showing hives. Um, studies have shown that uh, uh, we tend to uh, misdiagnose anaphylaxis if uh, skin symptoms are not present. So if the patient doesn't come in with a r itchy rash, um, but they have wheezing or stomach pain uh, as a symptom of allergic reaction, we may diagnose that as something else and fail to treat the patient appropriately for their allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. Uh, foods are the most common trigger in kids uh, and young adults while medications, foods, and uh, venom from bees or other insect, insects are uh, uh, fairly equal causes in adults. So in an adult with an allergic reaction, um, food uh, envenomations or medications are all equally possible cause uh, of the patient's symptoms. Um, foods that are responsible for uh, allergic reactions, 90% uh, of them are related to uh, peanuts, uh, tree nuts of other kind, cow's milk, uh, chicken eggs, uh, soy, wheat, shellfish, and other types of fish. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of the typical uh, causes of, of uh, food allergies, uh, particularly in adults. So anaphylaxis, uh, those risk factors that are um, uh, increase a patient risk for uh, fatal anaphylaxis or dying as a result of an allergic reaction, or patients who have a history of peanut or tree nut allergies, uh, patients who have a previous history of asthma, whether it's related to an allergy or not, uh, patients who are adolescents or young adults are more likely to die from anaphylaxis than uh, the other extremes of age, such as older uh, patients or uh, children, and any delay in epinephrine administration increases the risk of fatal anaphylaxis. So this uh, delay in epinephrine administration and the increased risk uh, to a fatal uh, event is why there's such an emphasis right now on timely, quick administration of epinephrine. That's why we have such a strong interest in our providers providing EMS or providing uh, uh, epinephrine on the scene if there's thought that the patient has anaphylaxis. And we'll talk in a little bit, but uh, the um, safety is of epinephrine uh, for all patient populations is, uh, is uh, assured. We should not withhold uh, epinephrine uh, because of concern over previous existing diseases. So, uh, you know, again, I can't overemphasize the importance for giving a patient epinephrine. It's quick, it's easy, it's part of our dispatch protocol for patients with a reaction, allergic reactions where the 911 operator will suggest the patient take epinephrine from an EpiPen uh, if it's available. That's why we would like you to give epinephrine as, quick as quickly as possible upon recognizing uh, the allergic event. What, what is the role of epi? Uh, epinephrine is the first-line therapy for the treatment of anaphylaxis, uh, and it's uh, been that way for the past five or six years. Um, 
and the primary reason we use epinephrine uh, in anaphylaxis to prevent fatality. Yes, it does cause uh, symptoms to improve uh, fairly quickly, but what we're using it for is to uh, help uh, assure that the patient dies, does not die from this acute allergic event. What are the benefits of Epi? Uh, it's the only medication that treats all symptoms of anaphylaxis. Um, it will treat uh, the symptoms regardless of whether they're GI or respiratory or cutaneous, and it will reverse hypotension if given quickly. Um, antihistamines are not life-saving, and they really only treat the itching that's associated uh, with the allergic reaction. So uh, while histamine is released by those mast cells, antihistamines only treat uh, the cutaneous or skin symptoms. It doesn't do anything to improve the patient's blood pressure. It doesn't do anything to relieve bronchospasm. Uh, it doesn't uh, fully counteract the effects of uh, histamine. Uh, glucocorticoids or steroids, or in our case, uh, decadron, um, are given to prevent a uh, secondary reaction. And you have to keep in mind that steroids are an important part of uh, treatment of anaphylaxis and allergies. It takes hours for, ep for these steroids to show their full effect. So uh, you could give somebody a quick dose of uh, steroids, but it's not going to have effect for a couple hours. Uh, we give it in the field because it, uh, the sooner we give it, the sooner we'll see improvement in the patient and see its effects. Um, but it, you should not rely on steroids as your cornerstone of treatment for allergic reactions. Um, so it works very well, but on a delayed basis. Uh, it prevents that biphasic reaction, but it also uh, stabilizes the mast cells, meaning it makes the mast cells less likely to release histamine and the other inflammatory chemicals that are, that are in the cell. What are the benefits of epinephrine? Um, recent uh, studies showed that patients who received epinephrine before arrival in the emergency department are less likely to be hospitalized with an odds ratio of 0.25, meaning their risk of admission for allergic reaction is reduced by 25% if we give it to the patient uh, quickly and in the field. Um, there's also some evidence that epinephrine uh, may prevent, uh, or given early, may prevent uh, those biphasic reactions where the patient has an episode of allergic reaction, they improve, and then they get worse again. And that's what I mean when I say a biphasic reaction. How about epi at home? Well, uh, another study uh, showed that up to 56% of patients uh, reported being afraid to use their epinephrine, um, and uh, they also cited fear of hurting their child or not knowing how to use the device or fear of causing harm. So uh, I think uh, you know we need to work more and more toward educating our patients, uh, particularly the providers who prescribe epinephrine, uh, that uh, you know it's a safe drug to use. Uh, make sure the patient is aware of the device and how to use it. Uh, sometimes we have to look to the pharmacist who dispenses the device to make sure the patient knows how to use it. I know some devices come with uh, dummy injectors so the patient can practice. But uh, I think it's uh, significant that up to 56% of the patients with, with uh, epinephrine at home uh, are afraid to use it. Um, what about this epinephrine dis uh, disconnect? Um, you know, why aren't we using it? Epinephrine is a first-line therapy, and it demonstrates superiority over all other possible therapies that we have, but we do not give it often enough. Um, there is a study out there where 61% of patients who called 911 for allergic reactions um, or anaphylaxis uh, met, met that uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease criteria, but only 17% received epi. I know our dispatchers are trying more and more to ask about uh, epinephrine and, and epipens at the scene and recommend administration if they have it. Um, and there's another study that uh, showed 28% of the patients who called 911 for allergic reaction or anaphylaxis um, who met criteria, um, only 51% uh, received epinephrine. Again, uh, patients just aren't getting it when they should be. What are some of the barriers to epinephrine uh, administration? Well, um, potential barriers for low use includes uh, under recognition of less typical anaphylaxis. I think patients uh, who've had it once or twice, they know what the symptoms are and they will self-medicate if they have the medication. But I think EMS providers in general um, under-recognize uh, the, at the uh, atypical uh, forms or manifestations of anaphylaxis. Um, there's a lack of a history of previous anaphylaxis, meaning, um, you know, how could somebody be having an anaphylactic reaction now if they never had one before? Well, sometimes it's time to have the reaction and we just need to treat it. And there are perceived contraindications, particularly to epinephrine use, uh, and there really is no uh, absolute contraindication to epinephrine, uh, and that would include pregnancy, age, or history of coronary artery disease or stroke. So if the patient has 
evidence of an acute allergic reaction, we, we should give them the medication. In my 35 years of clinical practice, I have only seen one adverse event related to epinephrine for uh, allergic reaction, and that's when the patient was given intravenous uh, epinephrine uh, when they really did not need IV epi, they needed uh, the intramuscular injection. Uh, the patient had transient ST changes, uh, STT changes on their 12 lead, which resulted in an overnight stay uh, for observation, but the patient ruled out for MI, um, and it was just a transient uh, episode of coronary artery spasm due to IV epi, which really should not have been given IV, should have been given IM. So in terms of patients taking IM medication at home or IM epinephrine at home, I have yet to see a patient have any complication of that therapy. Other barriers um, and concerns, uh, serious adverse events uh, regarding administration, um, and uh, it's been uh, very rare for IM dose and only about a 10% uh, uh, complication rate or adverse effect rate uh, in patients given IV epinephrine doses. Uh, fatal anaphylaxis is much more likely to be caused by delayed uh, epinephrine rather than by any, by any complication of the epinephrine administration. So again, epinephrine is a safe drug. Uh, use of the auto injector is thought to improve rates of administration um, as it decreases fears of dosing errors. Um, and um, data uh, about the uh, adequacy of the auto injector is mixed in the obese, and that's because they have such a large uh, amount of fatty tissue that um, the medicine uh, may not be well administered. Ideally, epinephrine is given intramuscularly, which I'll discuss in a moment. And, you know, if you have an obese patient and you're going to give them an epi, you may want to use an inch and a half needle rather than a shorter needle. Make sure you get that medicine down in the muscle where the blood will absorb it quickly. Uh, and uh, there's concern the needles may cause injury to the very small. Uh, that has not been shown to be a significant problem, uh, particularly if you're talking about using a uh, pediatric uh, EpiPen versus an adult EpiPen and I don't see that as a potential issue. I see more of an issue with the needles on the devices by patients uh, accidentally injecting themselves in the finger, um, and that, that is a problem, uh, but that's not a problem in terms of misuse or inappropriate use of epinephrine for an allergic reaction. Uh, again, sub-Q versus IM. Um, uh, the uh, mean time to maximum concentration um, was faster uh, using uh, IM versus sub-Q. So, you know, eight minutes versus 34 minutes. So make sure you have a long enough needle and give it intramuscularly. And um, uh, intramuscular injections in the, in the lateral muscle, the thigh, or the lateral thigh muscle, uh, had shorter time uh, to absorption than um, any shots in the arm. So if you have a patient uh, who needs intramuscular um, uh, epinephrine, the better dose is to give it to them in the thigh, and I would use the same uh, anatomic location as if you're going to give somebody uh, intramuscular ketamine. So the mid-lateral thigh is the best place to give somebody intramuscular epinephrine. Uh, there is an anaphylaxis toolkit out there. It's available through the American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, and it's available through the web page that I've got listed here. And um, Part of that is this uh, food allergy action plan, which talks about the various symptoms the patient may have and uh, discusses the various actions the patient is to take. Uh, it's included in the handout. Um, I will let you look at it there, but it's a good thing to have. And you could also um, refer the patients to the web page uh, and they can get a copy of this. So. Um, you know, it talks about the various symptoms and it includes instructions about calling 911 and what to do regarding uh, medication dosing and so on. So that, that, that uh, is a good tool to have and really what they have listed here is good for any patient who has potential for allergic reaction, whether it's food or uh, in, insect bites or other causes of allergic reactions. So let's uh, talk specifically about our protocol. Um, you know, I have slides uh, reproduced from, uh, from our protocol for adults and children. And if you look at it, we've got it worded so that epinephrine is Epinephrine is the first step other than cardiac monitor, but however, you know, if you walk in the room, patients got hives and they've got, uh, they look like they have an acute allergic reaction, give them the IM dose of epinephrine, then worry about IV access and the cardiac monitor. We will use albuterol uh, and atrovent uh, to uh, treat bronchospasm, so the patient with an acute allergic reaction with bronchospasm would get IM epinephrine followed up by um, atropine and, I'm sorry, by atrovent and albuterol. 
Eventually, we hope to give them uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine and dexamethasone. Uh, if the patient is hypotensive, they can um, be treated with an IV fluid bolus. If the patient has been given IM epinephrine and they continue to deteriorate, they can receive IV epinephrine either as a bolus um, or you can start on an epinephrine drip as per protocol uh, and the epinephrine drip uh, will do a lot to help turn them around. So, uh, you know, be uh, be uh, aware of the potential for significant hypotension where you need to give them large amount of fluids and you may need to give them a, a epinephrine as an epinephrine drip. So um, the kids are very similar fashion. The focus is on giving them uh, uh, epinephrine, give it to them quick and give it to them early. Worry about everything else after that. So that's my quick uh, run through on acute allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. Uh, I appreciate you listening in. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me a note via Workplace, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Thanks for listening.